Uh, I have a letter here from the Haley's. They're missionaries to Belgium. Can anybody tell me which flag up there is the Belgium flag? Oh, right. Yep, one on the other, black, yellow, and red. So uh, this letter is from uh, July and August. It says, uh, praise the Lord for an eventful and very busy summer here in God's service. In July alone, we've seen at least seven souls saved, many of them people we've been praying a long time for. Three of them were some of Lori's family that moved here from Romania. In addition to seeing souls saved, we were able to fit in one last baptism at the pond near our old building. It was for a young man who had been attending our church for many years with his family. We'd gotten saved more than a year ago. Well, he had not told me he had gotten it, this settled in his heart until we returned from the States. In July, we also held two special events for Belgian National Day. For one of those, I preached my first sermon entirely in Dutch. I often preach for a short time in Dutch when I am street preaching, but because the church is in English, I never preached a sermon in Dutch there until now. It was after this sermon that one of the men mentioned the above got saved. The other event was a short conference with Dr. Scott Caudill, the director of our mission board. Our conference was themed around reaching Belgium and marked our first services in our new building. I preached the first sermon, then Dr. Caudill came in and preached to our people, encouraging them greatly for the next few days. Then in August, we held our second ever vacation Bible school near the end of August, this time increasing from one day to three. We had well over 30 children attending, most of them every night, and several of them coming to church for their first time. It was a great blessing to see children get excited about the things of God. Uh, mine are still singing the songs and talking about what they have learned. Equally exciting was seeing the church full of volunteers every day looking for whatever they could do to help. By the last day, I think we had more volunteers than children and more and more people wanted to get involved. Also in August, we saw the highest summer attendance of our church we've ever seen and had a new record high attendance for the East Belgian Bible study as well. And he goes on to say, concerning our building, we received the keys to the building and began work in the beginning of July. Men and women and children all joined and helped to prepare the building so that we could open it in time for the conference. We worked every day at least 12 hours a day, but with the help of our people and Pastor Brent Hoffman and his church, we got the work done quickly. There is still work and we will continue to prove the building, but we can work at a more reasonable pace going forward. This has allowed us to focus more on evangelizing our new community. So far, we've seen a warm reception in the community. The restaurant that was there was well known, and so our remodeling has gone, gone, uh, gone a great deal of attention. We're also finding some things the hard way. In early August, we had 90 people in church, and our toilets quit working. So between services, some of our men and I had to repair them. At the end of July, we took pledges from both people in our church to raise money for the purchase of our building using a model similar to that of a faith promise giving. Through this, our church is pledged to give another $40,000 toward the purchase of the building by the end of the year. With this and donations that have come in, we are down to needing about 70,000 to be able to buy the building outright. Um, he says, um, God is providing and will certainly continue to provide. We just ask that each of you pray that the rest of the money will come in and that God will uh, get the glory for it. Please pray for this money to come in soon rather than later. If we can do this sooner than the end of the year, it will save us many major difficulties and possibility with the cost as well. Thank you uh, for all for your faithful prayers for us. Um, you are a much needed part of the ministry and we'll never, we will never know how much blessing, of a blessing you are to us, at least not on this side of eternity. But that is, that is good news. Seven souls saved there. They've gotten another new building. Um, Seventy thousand dollars, and in God's terms, is a drop in the bucket. We'll just pray that the Lord meets that soon. The sooner it's paid off, the less they have to pay an in interest or anything. Um, I see the faith, people there are faithful to their faith promise as well, and uh, it's a great work going on there in Belgium. Let's just remember the.
into a heart that sat through darkest tunnels the soul just sings oh save but I'm Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And then one, ver uh, one verse from the book of Mark, chapter 16, uh, which is our theme verse for our missions conference this year. Mark chapter 16 and verse 15. And the Bible says, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. That's our theme for our missions conference this year. And so a lot of our uh, decorations that we have are uh, represented of the world and what our responsibility is. Then over in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, it's where we'll be spending a lot of our time uh, this morning. The Bible says in verse 1, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. I want to preach to you this morning again a message that you've heard before. But it's a message I feel like that at least once a year we need to be reminded of it. Uh, on Faith Promise Missions Giving, let's pray. Father, thank you this morning for your word and... And uh, Father, just the privilege of being involved in world evangelism, I pray you'd impress upon our hearts today, uh, Lord, what you would have us do concerning this job that you've left us here to do, and that's spread the gospel to the ends of the earth. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, folks, from the resurrection to the ascension, over 2,000 years ago, Jesus gave the Great Commission five times. You know, in, in the Gospels, you know, we have uh, synonymous Gospels. Or, uh, the same event uh, will be uh, repeated in different Gospels. You have, may, it may be just a little bit of a slant. In, in different gospels, but, but this is not that. Jesus gave the Great Commission five times to go into the world and preach the gospel. 
Uh, you'll find it in the book of Matthew, the book of Mark, the book of Luke. You see it in the book of John. And then you also see it in the book of Acts. Five times in 40 days, he gave the Great Commission for the church to go into all the world and preach the gospel. But you know, folks, today half of the world is still without a church. Half of the world. Think about that. We take church for granted. We do. Folks, I, I believe we got, at Shalom Baptist Church, I believe we got a good church. But I'm telling you, we take church for granted. We come if nothing else gets in the way. Well, preacher, I'll be at the missions conference if nothing else comes up. Now, I'm, I'm not rebuking anybody. I'm just saying, I'll be in church if there's not a ball game at 930 on Sunday morning. Now, I'm not preaching any because none of you did that, right? <laughs> Think about this. We talk about the second coming of Jesus Christ, do we not? We've talked about it this morning. Church, are you looking for him? Well, a few of you are. Are you looking for him? He's coming. I, folks, you realize today we could see Jesus Christ? Think about that. Today we could see his face. We talk about the second coming. I was texting Al this week a little bit and you know, looking at all the events taking place in the world, I text Al, I said, Al, are you doing rapture practice over there? We talk about the second coming of Christ, but folks, look at, listen to me. Half of the world has not heard of his first coming yet. Think, let that sink in. We talk about the second coming of Christ. We're excited for it. I hope you are. We're looking for it. And half of the world hadn't heard about his first coming. Half of the world today is without a Bible. Anybody in this room don't have a Bible? Anybody in this room don't have two Bibles? Anybody in this room don't have three Bibles? I don't even know how many Bibles I've got. I've got a computer that's got, I don't know how many Bibles, it's, it's got Bibles in it about every language, <laughs> but half of the world don't have a Bible yet. There are 6,000 known languages today, and some of these statistics I have are pretty old, so it, there may be a little bit of variation in it, but 6,000 languages today, there are only 273 of those languages that have a Bible. We take it for granted, don't we? What if you were sitting today without a Bible? What would our life be today? Half of the world has no door-to-door -door evangelism. That means nobody's going door-to-door. -door. There's, there's no near neighbor evangelism. You don't... <laughs> You don't have to worry about somebody knocking on your door and inviting you to church. Two, it takes 2.1 churches today to produce a missionary. One missionary. Now this is an old statistic too. And, and I wrote these down some years ago. But today America, and, and this may be changed. We may be worse off than this today. America is ranked 16 in the world in sending out missionaries. We used to be number one. But they were at least 16 in sending out missionaries. Why? Why is that? You know, folks, we got more to do today than we've ever had to do in the past. There's more people living on the planet than there ever has been in the past. We've got more to do. But I want to say that there's, there's more that can be done today. The opportunities today are endless. 
I've been challenging you the last couple of weeks. How many of you have been trying to give out one track a day? Okay. I think two, up, two hands went up. There's so many things we can do today. So many ways that we can get the gospel out. Um, I, 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 like this, I like this thought here. We ought to be able to do more because there should be more of us. Now, I'm not talking about more in number. I'm talking about more spiritually than we were last year. We ought to be more spiritual today, uh, this year than we were last year. We should have grown in our faith. Our faith should grow as we walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. Why missions? There's, well, folks, there's less time to do it than we've ever had before. You know, folks, we've got less time right now, this minute, than we had two minutes ago, a minute ago. Well, there's less time to do it. We need to get busy. Uh, we live in an information age. How many of you have a, an iPhone? Put your hand up if you've got an iPhone. Uh, Android phone or whatever that. Okay, you can put you. In. Most everybody does. Listen, folks, you got more information at the tip of your finger than we've ever had in any time in history. We live in an information age, yet half of the world have never heard the name of Jesus Christ. I'm talking about why missions? Why do this? We talk about the second coming and half of the world has never heard about his first coming. Folks, that ought to be a motivation to do missions right there. It's a big job. How in the world can we get it done? Yet Jesus five times in 40 days gave us the great commission to go out and take the gospel to all the ends of the earth. How are we going to do that? Well, I believe that the Bible gives us a way to do it. Listen, I am the worst at raising money. I don't even like to preach on I'm a preacher and don't like preaching on money. How can that be? But I don't like it. But it's in the Bible. So we'll endeavor to do it. I've been involved in Faith Promise since 1984. It was the first year I got involved in Faith Promise. Faith and I got right. She'd got saved. I'd got right with the Lord. We got into church and, and we, were, we were confronted with tithing. And I'm like, oh my goodness. I can't make it from week to week, paycheck to paycheck. But I saw tithing in the Bible and I just started doing it. And boy, God just started meeting my needs. He didn't make me rich, but He met my needs. And has never since ceased to meet my needs. And then it wasn't long after that church we were in. It was, a, it was a missionary church. And then the preacher presented faith, promise, missions, given. And I'm like, oh my goodness, now he wants me to give more money. But I, I saw it in the Bible. So faith and I said, well, we're just going to start doing it. In 1984, we got involved in faith, promise, missions, given. I'm going to tell you what, folks, and I don't say this to brag and, and, and I don't say it for any other reason other than my faith has grown through the years. I tell you now, my faith promise is bigger than my tithe. And, and maybe I shouldn't even said that, but I, I, faith, it works. I hope I can show you that today. We read 2 Corinthians 8, 1 through 5. Let's look at some of these things here. It's a, it's, a, it's a missions giving passage in verse 3. The Bible says, For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves. They gave to their power or to their capability in verse 3. But in verse 3 also, they gave beyond their power or beyond their Capability. Look at verse 4. This is, this is so interesting. And, and you, you have to do some word studies here to get the thrust of what Paul was saying. Praying us with much entreaty 
that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints, praying us with much entreaty. I, I looked up that word praying this week. I preached this, this passage I don't know how many times, and I never really looked up the word praying. Drew, you a preacher. You ever looked that word up? No, well, no, I hadn't either till, till this week. Now, there are praying's mentioned a lot of times in the Bible. Preaching mentions a lot. And sometimes it's different words. They have slightly different meanings. The word praying here means begging us. L folks, literally, by the inspiration of God, uh, Paul put this passage in the Scripture. And that word pr praying there means begging us with much entreaty. With much entreaty, a stirring address, a persuasive discourse. Uh, um, I have, in the past, I have gone places and, and, and I've had people, as, as a preacher, I've, I've, I've preached all over the place, all over the country. And, and I've been in places and, and sometimes somebody will come up to me with a piece of money and they'll say, Preacher, I want you to take this. And I'm like, oh, no, I, you know, I don't want to take your money. And the, no, no, God wants me to give this to you. Ever happened to you, Drew? Yeah. They're praying you. They're begging you. I want you to take this. I want to be a blessing to you. Don't rob me of my blessing is what the, the, these people at the Churches of Macedonia were saying, Paul, don't rob us of being a blessing. Take this, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift. They were begging Paul to take money. Heard somebody say one time, two miracles are taking place here. You got church members begging preachers to take money. And the second miracle is, it's amazing that they would have to. But folks, that's what's taking place in this passage. Verse 3 said, to their power, to their ability, they gave. Uh, they, they looked uh, within themselves. Uh, in our day, we'd pull our wallet out. We'd look in and say, we've got this much money. And, and we, you know, to, to their ability, to their power, what they had, they gave. That's given within a budget. It's figuring out what I can afford. It's saying that, uh, you know, I want to give to missions and, and uh, down at the workplace, I, I spend so much, so many dollars a week on coffee. Starbucks. Tim Hortons. Well, if I don't go to Tim Hortons five times this week, I got this much. That's a budget. That's what I can figure out that I can do. Right? I tell you folks, when I first started Faith Promise Missions giving, that's sort of what I did. Now, I didn't go to Tim Hortons or Starbucks or none of that. But, but the vending machines at the place where I worked, if I didn't put a dollar in there and, and get a pack of cheese crackers, I, well, I can give that to missions. That's how I started out. Uh, but that's not faith. You know, there are some churches, and, and I know of some churches that do that. They'll take the number of families in a church. They'll figure out their missions budget. We've got this many missionaries. This is how much money we send them. And then they'll send out to the families, this is how much each family mo uh, owes so we can pay our missionaries. Folks, that's taxation. That's not missions given. Uh, most of you know this, and if you don't know it, I'm going to say it again. Folks, I have no idea. I have no idea who gives what to this church. I choose to do it that way. There's not a biblical law that says I can't look at the book and see what people give. But I choose not to do it so I can stand here and preach on giving and not know what anybody in this church gives. Mr. Bissell, am I telling the truth? Well, where Mick Shaw is, he's our treasure now. Jack is our former treasure. But you can ask him. I choose not to know. I don't know what anybody, you give to faith promise, I don't know what you give. That's between you and the Lord. But you'll never be given a bill. You'll never be 
taxed if we don't do things like that around here. We give by faith. Taxation is not faith. So how does all of this work then? Look in verse 3 again. The Bible says, To their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power, beyond their ability, they were willing of themselves. Beyond their ability, they gave. Now listen, folks, if you're going to give beyond your ability, you're giving something that you don't have. Right? Do you agree that's what the Scripture's saying? Beyond their ability, they, how do you do that? If I, don't, if I don't have it, how can I give it? Well, there's where the faith comes in. There's where the faith comes in. It's a miracle. The miracle of faith. The Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews, now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Faith is a substance. It's real. Listen, folks, my faith is real this morning. It's the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. My, my faith, I put my faith in Jesus Christ and there's a substance to it. There's a reality to my faith. The Bible tells us in Hebrews eleven six, 6, but without faith, it is impossible to please Him. So folks, we're going to please God. If I were to say this morning, how many of us want to please God? I believe every hand in the room would, would go up. But folks, without faith, you can't do it. The Bible says, correct, right? Y'all with me? Don't go sleep on me. We're going somewhere. In Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, the Bible tells us faith in Jesus Christ is the only way to be saved. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Listen, folks, we're saved by faith. I didn't do anything for it. I didn't pay anything for it. I put my faith and my trust in Jesus Christ. And the evidence is He saved me. That's reality. That's how I got saved. If you're saved this morning, that's how you got saved. If you're not saved this morning, that's how you can be saved. But then, after salvation, listen folks, it's still impossible to please God without faith. The Bible says in Colossians 2 and verse 6, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. So I put my faith in Jesus Christ to be saved. Now after I'm saved, He still wants me to walk by faith. I can't always see it. But I put my faith in it. It's real. The Bible says in Romans chapter 1, Galatians chapter 3, Hebrews chapter 10, that the just shall live by faith. We don't live by sight. We live by faith. Now listen to me. I believe the day's coming when we are going to live by sight. We will see Him. But until that day, we live by faith. We got saved by faith. We live by faith. We ought to give by faith. Stay with me. Folks, in giving what I can budget... If I can see it, I make so much money, I can budget this much to give to mission. That's not faith. And if it's not faith, is it pleasing to God? You answer the question. Thank you. No. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. It's not a bad way to give. It's, it, it's not sin to give that way. But it's not faith. The Macedonian churches gave by faith. They gave, the Bible says, they gave beyond their power. They were living by faith. Oh, does that make any sense? I've looked. This is my ability to give. But I'm going to give more than I got to give. Does that make any sense? 
Without faith, it don't. It don't, it don't make sense. Don't live. That's the way the government lives. <laughs> they spend what they don't have. But anyway, that's not. That's another message for another day. But it works by faith, folks. It works by faith. Turn with me to the book of First Kings for just a second. The book of First Kings, chapter seventeen. Let's notice how this works a little bit. First Kings chapter 17, Elijah. One of my favorite, favorite characters in the Bible. I love reading about Elijah. Elijah the Tishbite was an inhabitant of Gilead in verse 1. Said unto Ahab, you know, oh wicked Ahab, what a wicked king he was. He said to Ahab, as the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And so he went into Ahab. He said, Ahab, God says it's not going to rain, and it's not going to rain. And he walked out. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying to Elijah, after he had pronounced, there's going to be no rain, he says, get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded, look at it, the ravens to feed thee there. Have you ever thought about that? Now, Elijah's not going to rain. I want you to go down by brook chair. If you're going to drink of the water of that brook, and I'm going to send the ravens to bring you food every day. Hmm. Yeah, right, Lord. It'd be like expecting some of these seagulls down here on the Niagara River to Come drop us a piece of chicken today. That's not going to happen. It took a little bit of faith to believe that. And, it, and so he went and did according to the word of the Lord. And For he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith that is before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning and bread and flesh in the evening. And he drank of the brook. wonder where those ravens got that food at. I believe they got it down at the palace, down there where Ahab was living. I believe they flew in there and took Ahab's food and took it down to Elijah down by the brook. It came to pass after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain. And listen, folks, that brook didn't dry up all at once. Ahab or, or Elijah was sitting there and he watched that brook dry up little bit by little bit by little bit till there was no more water. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I've commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. You know what would have went in my mind right there? Well, God must have a rich little old widow lady down there. She's going to take care of me. She's loaded. And she's going she to take care of my needs. So he arose, went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow woman was there gathering of sticks. Hey, look at folks, there was a drought there also. She was a gathering of sticks. And he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I've not a cake but a handful of meal in a barrel and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I'm gathering two sticks that I may go in and dress it for me and my son that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said to her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first and bring it to me. And after, make for thee and for thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. But I'm just saying whatever, God, you put your faith in God, God will not fail you. Go down there by the brook. The bird's going to bring you something to eat. Oh, by now that's gone. Now go down here to this poor widow woman. She's about to die of starvation, her and her son, and she's going to take care of you. And, and, and boy, just every time she dipped down into that barrel, it, it just kept replenishing itself. Folks, we live by faith today, don't we? How many of you are living for the rapture of the church? We've been talking about it today. We, we, mentioned, we talk about it all the time around here. You, you believe it's going to happen?
Well, what makes you believe it? Faith. Faith in what? In what God said. I don't care what it looks like out there. I don't care what the circumstances are. I don't care what the situation says. I know, I know what God said. And there's where I'm putting my faith. And I believe one day we're going to hear the trumpet. And he's going to take us out of here. We live by faith. We trust God by faith. We ought to give by faith. Now, turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Faith promise. I've been called a heretic for preaching this. And um, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, look at verse 6. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. We just, he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Look at verse 7. Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. It's a promise. Verse 7 says, every man as he purposeth in his heart. It's a determination. It's a promise beforehand. Folks, can I say to you this morning, I'm going to say it to you this morning, that, that missions giving is not a designation of your tithe. This was, a, this, was a, this was a faith promise gift. The tithe is the tithe. This was a purposing of the heart. In Malachi 3 and verse 8, the Bible says, you've robbed me in two ways. God says, you've robbed me in two ways. Will a man rob God, yet ye have robbed me? But ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? The Bible says, in tithes and in offerings. And I wouldn't want to be, to have to stand before God, and God looks at you, robber. But God says, you've robbed me in tithes and offerings. There's two things. There's tithes and there's offering. And, 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 and I've been confronted today that, that those will say that tithes aren't for today. That was under the law. Listen, folks, they were paying tithes 400 years. Abraham paid tithes 400 years before the law. In Matthew chapter 23, Jesus said, you ought to pay your tithes. In Matthew 23, 23, says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law. Judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought you have done and not leave the other undone. You, you pay in tithe of this, that, and the other. You ought to do that. But don't leave the other undone. Mercy, judgment, faith. That was Jesus' day. In Hebrews chapter 7, when Paul is, he is, and I believe Paul wrote the book of Hebrews, and I know there's a little bit of, little bit of question about that, but in Paul's day, as he's out starting churches, he told the book, uh, those in, in, in the book of Hebrews, he says, in this day you pay tithes. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 8. So it was going on in Paul's day. So you got it 400 years before the law. You got it during the law. Jesus said it in his day. Paul wrote it in his day. You ought to pay your tithe. Now, we know what a tithe is, right? Tithe is, is how much? It's a, it's a tenth. It's a tenth of whatever you make. You make a dollar, ten cent. That's your tithe. And so forth and so on. But now, watch this. In Malachi chapter 3 and verse 10, the Bible says, Bring ye all the tithes into the, look at, storehouse, that there may be meat in my house, saith the Lord of hosts. If I'll not open to you the windows of heaven and pour out you a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. So bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse. That's Old Testament. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, the Bible says this, Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store. So the Old Testament was the storehouse. Paul says, now lay by you in store. 
as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. There's an interesting play on those two words, the storehouse and the store. It's a translation of the same word. And I believe Paul is making a, a connection with bringing the tithe into the temple and bringing the tithe into the, the house of God. He, he, he's drawing that and bringing it together. I think for the Christian, paying tithes is not optional. It's either obedience or it's disobedience. But then we've got this offering part. Folks, that's where the praying comes in. Lord, how much? How much? Faith promise ought to be an offering. God said, you've robbed me in tithes and offering. Faith promise is not a designation of your tithe to mission. It's an offering. It's something that's beyond. And, and I'm not even saying you have to do it. Well, maybe I am saying you, you should do it. But it's a purpose of the heart. It ought to be an offering. Lord, here's my obligation. But here's this need out here. And, I want to give an, I, and I'm going to give an offering to it. It's a purpose of the heart. It's a prayerful determination. Lord, how much would you have me to give? Faith promise. It involves a promise. It involves a commitment. Lord, you put this heart on my, uh, you put this much on my heart, and by faith I'm going to give this to missions. It takes a commitment, and folks, there's a lack of commitment today. There's a lack of commitment in all areas of life. There's a lack of commitment in marriages today. There's a lack of commitment in jobs today. There's a lack of commitment in churches today. People just don't want to commit. But God wants us to be committed to Him. I'm almost done. I've got a few more things to say. Stay with me. Look in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 8. Look at verse 5. The Bible says, And this they did not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. First they gave themselves to God. Listen, folks, when you give yourselves to God, everything else will be easy to give. But first, they gave themselves to the Lord. Faith promised missions. Now, let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Look down at verse 14. And I'll pick up a little speed here. For we stretch not ourselves beyond measure, as though we reach not unto you. For we are come as far as to you, uh, as far as to you, also in preaching the gospel of Christ, not boasting of things without our measure, that is, of other men's labor, but having hope, when your faith is increased, that we shall be enlarged by you according to our rule abundantly, to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you, and not boast in another man's line of things made ready to our hand. Missions. What is missions? It's extending the gospel beyond the local reach, uh, the, the, the reach of our local church. That's what missions is. It's reaching different ethnic groups in our area. I tell you folks, there are a lot of ethnic groups in our area. I, I've said this from, from the time I moved here over 20 years ago. We can be a missionary to the world. All we got to do is go up to Niagara Falls. And you can be a missionary to the world. It's home missionaries. we got a couple home missionaries we support from our church. It's missions abroad. In different, the, re, just, just beyond this congregation, whatever it is, that's what missions are. It's missionaries on deputation. You know, they're out there, missionaries out there right now going church to church to church to church to church, trying to get to the mission field. Paul's a missionary and he's writing to supporting churches hoping that their faith will be increased. Because when their faith is increased, their dollars are going to increase. Then when the dollars are increased, Paul's going to be able to spread, uh, to spread the gospel to even more areas than he's been in the past. And folks, that's what it's about. 
Hey, listen, when you give to missions at Shalom Baptist Church, every dime that you give goes to missions. We don't pay the water bill with it. We don't pay the heat bill with it. Hey, listen, if, if, if we can't pay the heat bill around here, we're going to pay our missionaries. All right? So wear a jacket if it gets so cold we can't pay the heat because missionaries are going to get paid. That's where your faith promise mission. You don't go to anything else. It goes to spreading the gospel to the regions beyond. That's what it is. You think of missionaries that we've got, and we've got them around the world. Folks, they're dependent on us. We've made a promise. We made a commitment to support them. And they're dependent on that support. We need to do more than just pat them on the back. God bless you. Be warmed. Go on your way. No, we need to pray for them. You know, I, I don't know any other church. I, I'm saying there's not one, but I don't know any other church that reads a missionary prayer letter on a Sunday morning. Why do you do that, preacher? Because I want you to know what our missionaries are doing. I want you to know what their needs are. If they have a need that we might be able to help if we can. Uh, we, do, we need to do more than just pat them on the back and say be warmed. And we, we need to give. We need to pray, but we need to give also. That's what missions conference is about. God has told us to do it, and he's told us how to do it. And I believe that's faith, promise, missions, giving. Faith giving. Now, let me talk about giving for just a second. And uh, chapter 8, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And I'm, I'm almost, I promise you this time, I'm almost done. The Bible says, How that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy, and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches, look at, of their liberality. Now listen, folks, I never want to be a liberal. I can give you reasons for it. And I'm not being political right now. But when it comes to money, God wants us to be liberal. The liberality here just means that you'll be generous in your giving. I think it's fun to give money to missionaries. Well, we've supported a lot of mission projects. We've got our missionaries that we support, a certain amount. But we've had needs that have come across. And we've given thousands of dollars to missionaries. Boy, isn't that fun to do? Don't, you just, don't it just feel good when you give to a missionary need like that? I think it's fun to do. In verse 5, the Bible says, And this they did not as we hoped, but first they gave their selves, own selves to the Lord. Listen, when you give yourselves to God, it's not hard to give to missions then. In 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 7, the Bible says, God loves a cheerful giver. Um, I, <laughs> I told you about Norman years ago. He told the story first, but he was at McDonald's one day. You know, got his meal and everything they ate. He was with the preacher, and, and Norman put a $20 tip on the table at McDonald's. And the preacher said to Norman, said, Norman, you can't do that here. Norman said, my father told me I could. Just grinned. He said, God loves a cheerful giver. And uh, in Acts 20 and verse 35, the Bible says, more blessed to give than to receive. Listen, folks, I, I'd a whole lot much more rather be on the giving end than the receiving end. Sometimes you have to be on the receiving end, though. And it's good to have somebody on the giving end. But, the, but look at it in verse 2. That in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded to the riches of their liberality. There's some statements in there that just don't go together, folks. Trial of great affliction and abundance of their joy. Their deep poverty abounded to the riches of their liberality. These weren't rich people. 
But they wanted to give to God's work. They wanted to give to Paul that he could preach the, the gospel to the regions beyond. This folk, world's not going to understand that. I'm not sure we understand it all the time. But it's faith. It's faith. Somebody says, give till it hurts. Mm -mm. Don't. Give till it feels good. Um, it's not like paying taxes. I, I, I don't like paying taxes. I, I don't. For the longest time, I didn't like giving a tip. And I got challenged with it. Oh, listen, every time you take that track and you go to a place and eat, put a good tip in there. Put a good tip in there. For one thing, my, my name's on that track. <laughs> my phone number's on that track. <laughs> but beyond all that, the gospel's in that track. Don't be cheap. Talk to that waitress. Say anything I can pray for you about today. Oh, I like to say, thank you for taking care of me today. And I hand them that track. It's got a piece of money in it. I don't want to be cheap for that. And, and I walk away from there. I tell you, uh, we were in um, um, Pennsylvania, Titus. We was at that restaurant. Shady Maple. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and we were sitting there and we, we put a big old tip in that in that track. We gave it to that lady. We were leaving and that waitress traced, chased us down. Now she said, so I can't remember the exact word, Titus, you might remember. No one's ever done anything for me like this. You know. She got the gospel. God just loves a cheerful giving. And that felt so good. Uh, John 3.16, and I'm, I'm, I'm done, I promise. Giving is a byproduct of love. For God so loved the world, what? That he, that he gave. And folks, God didn't hold back when he gave. He gave the very best. Starting this coming week, we're going to be handing out faith promise slips. Folks, all I want you to do is ask God, don't ask me, just say, God, what would you have me to give for missions in the coming year? And folks, if you'll do this, if you'll ask God to give you a number, God will. And if you'll just commit to doing that, God will meet the need. I'll never call you. Mick will never call you. I promise you, Mick Shaw will never call you. <laughs> about your faith promise. Nobody will ever know but you and God. If you'll make that commitment to Him, you'll be amazed by the way God will meet those needs. I've heard people say, Preacher, I, I committed. I, I got involved in that. Didn't know how I was going to do it. And the next week I went to work and, and got a raise at work. God met the need. And other things, uh, other ways. Folks, since 1984 I've been given to faith promise. And God is blessed. He's been good. And, and I wouldn't have it any other way. I wouldn't have it any other way. Faith, promise, missions, giving. Will you ask God what He would have you to do? And I believe everybody can be involved in it. I think everybody should be involved in it. And if we'll do what God puts in our heart, it'll be amazing the amount of money we'll give to missions this year. Let's pray.